Welcome to episode 303 of the Postal Hub podcast. I'm Ian Kerr. Joining me in just a moment to share some insights into the negotiations between UPS and Teamsters on a new UPS employee contract is Dean McCuba, Managing Partner USA for Crossroads Parcel Consulting. Joining me on the line is Dean McCuba. Dean is the managing partner at USA for Crossroads Parcel Consulting. Dean, welcome back. Uh, we're going to talk about UPS and its negotiations with the Teamsters Union. It's the well. How often do these contracts get negotiated with UPS? Are they five-year contracts typically? Yeah, typically they're five-year contracts. That's correct. Now, let's just have a bit of an overview of the situation because there's a whole lot happening in industrial relations in the USA. We've seen stuff with Amazon drivers and their contractors, Amazon warehouses. There's the FedEx pilots. Is it the FedEx pilots who are still negotiating, Dean? Is is that right? They have been going on for two years and it could go on for another two years. So don't hold your breath on that one. So now when it comes to UPS though, Dean, can you give us an overview of the situation? What's the story with UPS, its drivers? Are they all employees? What are they, I also recall there being something to do with different classes of drivers and stuff like that. What's what? Just give us a quick overview, please. UPS has the highest paid drivers in the industry, whether it's the regional carriers or contractor models or, or, or whatever. Um, and UPS is doing very well. And obviously the Teamsters represent the drivers and they're looking for uh, concessions in certain areas. One area is previously there's been a lower paid class of driver negotiated into the collective bargaining agreements. And uh, the big deal for the Teamsters, and they represent the drivers, I mean, those are the drivers, obviously, is to bring everybody up to the same level and not have this lower paid class of drivers. Now, there's been a lot of talk around these negotiations. Uh, It seems to have been in the news basically weekly. And of course, uh, just recently, UPS announced its latest round of results. So UPS is back in the news again. So why is there so much talk about these negotiations? Why is it in the headlines so much? It's not just about there being two tiers of drivers, surely. You know, th- there's a couple of reasons here. Number one, um, I've been, I worked at FedEx and UPS for 37 years, and I've been doing the consulting gig for seven years, eight years. So I've been through a lot of these UPS negotiations And this one is getting more attention by far than any previous negotiation. One of the reasons I think that is, is because of people like you and me, pundits who are out there putting information out electronically on the direction it could go. I don't like being dragged into this, Dean, but anyway. (laughs) So, So I think you can blame... The, uh, the industry journals, and there's a plethora of them out there online, right, that are constantly commenting on this. So this is creating more awareness about what's going on than ever before. So that is part one of it. So if that's part one, then that's not the whole story. It's not just because there are more, there's more maybe media attention around it. There's been a change in leadership at the Teamsters as well, hasn't there? Yeah, yes, there has been, and they're much more radical than the previous two Teamster administrations have been. There's been talk that the rank and file have been dissatisfied with the past two negotiations with UPS that the uh, the the group at the Teamsters, the management group, was not properly representing what the drivers really wanted, or they felt they could have gotten more out of UPS. So. This group of Teamsters management has made a commitment to make amends for what's happened previously. And they're going to be very, they, they've stated they're going to be very aggressive in getting their demands met and they're not going to hesitate to strike. So they're, they're threatening the strike scenario much more this time around than it had been in previous years. And we've seen strike action in other markets. With well, Royal Mail is an example that springs to mind. And some of that's been around things like you know, the increase in the cost of living and wages not keeping track or keeping up with those increases in the cost of living. 
just how would you characterize though the relationship between UPS management and its employees or management and its drivers, I suppose, more specifically? It's always been a little hostile, but it's not horrible by any means. Their CEO, Carol Tomei, who's probably been there at least two years, maybe going on three years, she's been very open about recognizing and working with frontline employees. If you're online and, and, and you're looking items that are posted or the UPS website postings, you always see Carol Tomei surrounded by frontline employees. So what they've been doing is they've been spending more time at that level communicating directly with employees and, and trying to get the employees to understand this is what we need to do to make UPS more successful. This is a, a major change from UPS's management style and the way they communicated with and recognized employees for the benefits they make to the company. One of the problems is if you're going out there and you're telling, if you, if you have a, a union relationship with your rank and file, if you go out there and tell them they're really great and fantastic and doing a great job, then what happens come contract negotiation time is the union says, look, pay us more because you're telling us how great we are. And so that's actually can work against you in this type of scenario. But look at Carol Tomei is an outstanding CEO, one of the best CEOs in industry in the U.S., let alone transportation. And I think the answer is to get her in front of even larger and more employees in the next three months and get those employees to understand, yes, we want to pay you more, but we also need to be successful. And if we can't be successful, then paying you more may not have long-term benefits because we could be in trouble going down the path. So I think you're going to see her communicating even more so directly with employees, large group employees, those nasty Teamsters who are generally very nice people, just like other drivers. And I think that's going to be effective if they can get her in front of the rank and file to plead UPS's case. Now, apart from wages and the two-tiered uh, driver pay structure, are there any other you know, f- key flashpoints that you're aware of, or that you think might be in, uh, you know, might be highlighted as part of these wage negotiations? You know, wh- there there have been issues in the last two summers about uh, health-related issues to working in the UPS trucks during the summer. I mean, it's really difficult work. Those trucks are are, are painted really brown. They're painted brown. Yes, they are. Isn't there a thing a few years ago where they worked on changing the color of the roof so that it reflected more heat? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not sure if, they're, if they might not be doing that already, uh, but it, it, is, it is a big deal. It's a serious problem. And Carol Tomei has come out and stated that that is something that they want to address. But the biggest point, clearly, is the second tier of lower paid drivers They want them brought up equal with the legacy drivers. And that's the biggest deal for UPS management. They have to go ahead and figure out how they're going to go ahead and satisfy those requests or requirements for higher pay. Because actually, obviously, the pay has not kept up with inflation in recent years, right? And so the union is going to look for UPS to directly tie future pay raises more directly into inflation. And that's going to be difficult for UPS to agree to. Dean, let's talk about the possibility of strike action then, because that's something that's sort of been floated from time to time. And there was a strike, uh, what was it, 1997? Is that, have I got that right? That's right. Yes. So what's what do you think here? What what's the what? Tell us about the previous strikes and what's, sort of in the pipeline here? So I worked at FedEx during the 97 UPS strike, and you cannot believe how horrible it is. The shipping customers, the things that they do to try and get their packages, their, the, the UPS shipping customers, what they try to do to get packages into the networks of the other carriers. So it is, it, it's a horrible situation. We would have packages stacked up six, eight, 10 feet tall around our FedEx drop boxes. So, cause, cause the customer knew, well, they're going to stop and pick up this drop box. So if I just leave our boxes alongside the drop box, they'll get those too. You have to hire security. 
at all the drop-off facilities for FedEx because it gets real tense and nasty at that point where you have so many people in line and you have FedEx saying, no, we can't take your packages. Now, it's a little different this year because we have more and bigger and stronger regional carriers. That's going to be helpful. Also, we have more forward stocking distribution models where retailers are putting their packages closer to the customers, the consumers in major markets, and they're using on-demand delivery companies or local delivery companies to make those local deliveries. So that'll take a little bit of heat off of it. Something else that's interesting is Amazon is in play this time, and they weren't uh, last time. So what you're going to see happen if UPS goes on strike is all those retailers that were totally dependent on Amazon, they already know the consumer, when they bump into that and they go to a retailer that was uh, with only UPS and they tell them, we can't ship your package, they're going to go to Amazon immediately because Amazon is going to be saying, hey, we have our own delivery network. We can we can support this. So what you can do is you can look for Amazon's business to increase dramatically in the event of a UPS strike because they have their own the last mile delivery capability. Amazon will have to be very careful to control that. The hardest thing to do if you're a competitor during this type of situation where UPS goes on strike is control the intake of packages. And that's very important. Otherwise, the whole system fails because it's flooded with more packages than you can handle. It's almost reminiscent of the early days of the pandemic when there was a sudden surge of parcels and various carriers were throttling the volumes that they would accept. Uh, Of course, if you're a postal operator, it's a little bit more difficult to throttle the volumes. But it's interesting what you said, though, Dean, about Amazon because there was some speculation you know, about that Amazon will open up its delivery network to others. But what you've just said is that the consumer will actually make the choice. If the consumer sees that they're delivering it. The last thing Amazon wants to do is go out there and prospect customers where they have to make a separate pickup uh, stop from a customer who has nothing to do with the retail industry. So I think they'll be focused on just picking up the slack from new business that they get from consumers who tried to ship via another retailer that was exclusively with UPS and they couldn't ship. I think they'll have so many packages just as a result of that scenario that they don't have to go after any additional packages, nor do they want to. Now, in the US, it's an interesting industrial relations system that you've got there. Let's just call it that, interesting. And the president of the USA could yet have a role in all of this. Why? You know, I'm not going to get into the legislation that regulates the relationship of carriers to the government. The president and Congress would have a lot of influence in trying to prevent a strike. What I think would actually happen is they would probably, if if things got very bad and negotiations broke down and they were really far apart, I think the government would let them strike but not let them stay on strike for an extended period of time. Last time, UPS was on strike for two weeks. It was devastating. If there is a strike, I think it'll be for a much shorter period of time because then the president will step in along with Congress and they don't want to have to legislate the UPS drivers going back to work. I think they'll Give them an opportunity to strike if necessary for that short period of time. Then they're going to step in and they're going to say, guys, if you don't figure this out in the next two days, then we are going to legislate your drivers going back to work. And they don't want to do that. Now, let's talk about roadie. People with long memories will recall that UPS, they acquire all of roadie. Yes, they have them all now. Yeah, they they own the entire company. So what is roadie and how does it? potentially fit into all of this? Well, I don't know that it does. By the way, and I'm glad you mentioned Rody because that's another serious uh, point of interest for the Teamsters. They don't want to see business shed it off to Rody. Rody is an on-demand 
last mile delivery company. What Rody can do for UPS is support the forward stocking distribution model or the micro fulfillment center. So that helps UPS tremendously moving forward as more retailer volume, e-commerce volume goes to that type of distribution model. So it's critically important to UPS that Rody not come into play, meaning I don't, th- I think the Teamsters will try and put limits on what UPS can do with Rody. I think long term, it's really important to UPS. And I think they will not let that happen. I, I think UPS will let the Teamsters strike over them wanting to be able to control what UPS can do with Rody. At the end of the day, the forward stocking distribution model that depends on local on-demand delivery services, it's a bit of a threat to both FedEx and UPS because what it means is that large retailer who had a facility in, in California and was shipping product across the country on an order-by-order order basis, now what that means is that company is probably setting up forward stocking micro fulfillment centers or securing those services via a third party, a 3PL, uh, they're probably setting those up. And that that longest delivery for UPS from zone eight to zone two, it's going to feel pressure. And there's going to be fewer of those shipments because many of those shipments will now be, potential shipments will be warehoused in forward stocking fulfillment centers and delivered by on-demand delivery companies. Now, I think that UPS is at a great advantage over FedEx because they bought Rody a few years ago. They've been experimenting with it. They're able to figure out how can we make this work. Rody is critical, in my opinion, to UPS's long-term success, not in one or two years, but in five or 10 years, as more and more of these retail shipments are moved to forward stocking fulfillment models. Now, something I should have asked you at the beginning, um, (laughs) we'll cover it now, is are there any other employees in the UPS network that are part of these negotiations? Is it just about the drivers or is it also about the, um, what are they called, the blokes who work, the blokes, the people who work on the ramps and loading and things like that? Yeah, so UPS tends to vendor out the ramps or, or the aircraft operations support. They tend to vendor a lot of that out But where they do have them, they would be impacted. And also the handlers inside those hubs would be impacted. I think what what happens is we tend to forget how many tens of thousands of handlers are employed in those UPS and FedEx hubs. And these are huge regional hubs. So they would would be impacted also. But, you know, those are part-time jobs nearly exclusively. And they don't really have nearly as much power in influencing how the Teamsters negotiate that contract. Are they going to be party to an increase in pay? Yeah, they are. But the choke point there is the drivers. That's where UPS really has their plate full and they have to try and figure out a way to satisfy both the drivers and the negotiation team from the Teamsters. And it's you know, the drivers, if it gets to the drivers, they're probably okay. The problem, because they're not, the drivers as a group aren't as radical, in my opinion, as Teamsters management. So the key is getting the proposal completed with or accepted by Teamsters management. And then if it gets to the drivers, I'm fairly comfortable that it'll it'll be approved, endorsed. So Dean, there we are in about 20 minutes, you've covered all the major points of these current negotiations between UPS and the Teamsters Union representing UPS employees. Something that everybody's going to be watching with great interest, I suppose, not, you know, because it's the current delivery landscape in the US is very competitive. You've got the changes happening at FedEx, which we haven't even talked about which could even have an impact on the UPS negotiations. I know that in a future conversation, Dean, we're going to cover what's happening there with FedEx 
express and ground merging and what that could mean for the employee or contractor model at you at FedEx and what that could mean for FedEx's costs and what that could mean for then the kind of business UPS is trying to do anyway, everybody. You can see where I'm leading with this. Ian, can I, if, if I can make one last point tying into what you just said, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, recording this on 426 and on, yesterday on 425, UPS announced their Q1 earnings and they were pretty bad. That should actually come into play in a big way in the negotiations as UPS will be able to leverage that as a long-term economic trend that is going to negatively impact their earnings. And as a result, they're not in a position to pay these drivers or grant the increases that the Teamsters are requesting. So that lousy Q1 earnings report could, in the end, help UPS negotiate a more reasonable settlement. There we go. Every cloud has a silver lining, I think is what Dean's trying to say. (laughs) Perhaps. I don't know. Oh, dear. We'll be watching it with great interest. I'm sure every e-commerce retailer listening to this will be watching it with, you know, sweaty palms. (laughs) Sweaty palms? I don't know. (laughs) Oh, Dean, say, Ian, wrap it up here. Dean, that's a great idea. I'll wrap it up here. Dean McCuba from Crossroads Parcel Consulting. Thank you very much for joining us on the Postal Hub podcast today. Thank you for having me, Ian, as always. Coming soon on the Postal Hub podcast, Marcus Reckling, CEO Germany of DHL Express. We've got Charles Brewer, CEO of Poz Malaysia, and Snitko from Omnic returns as well, and many other great guests. Too numerous to mention right now. Make sure you don't miss any of these episodes. Sign up for the Postal Hub e newsletter so you get an email every time a new episode comes out. Go to thepostalhub.com for more on that, and do subscribe to the podcast in your favorite pod. Favorite, famous, favorite. I said some mixture of the two there. Anyway, you know what I mean. The podcast platform of your choice, be it Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, etc., etc. Subscribe, leave a rating, leave a review. It all helps. Thanks in advance, everyone. Uh, what else can you do? You can subscribe to the Daily Delivery Digest. Go to thepostalhub.com for more information on that, as well as subscribing to the Decarbonizing Delivery Newsletter. That's an interesting topic. What else can I tell you? Um, LinkedIn. If you're on LinkedIn, follow me. Follow the company page on LinkedIn. That'd be nice. And if you want to email me about anything at all, like sponsoring the podcast or being on the podcast, or maybe just if you want to know my opinion on delivery drones, my email address is ian at thepostalhub.com. I'm Ian Kerr. Thanks for listening in, and I look forward to your company next time on the Postal Hub podcast. Postal Hub.